Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll talk about regulatory intelligence. So mainly we are talking a lot about regulatory quality, a lot of things, but how can you keep up to date? How can you know more about what is coming, etc.? We'll talk mainly about that uh, today. So for that, I have with me uh, Ivan Perez Chamorro from MedBoard, who is here to do- discuss about that. So hi, Ivan. Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Hi, Monir. Thank you so much for having me here as well. Great. Yeah. And Ivan was um, well known, if I can say, from the beginning of the podcast because we had a lot of uh, podcasts together. I mean, few podcasts together. And he was one of the first ones that was making a podcast with me. So really, thanks for that. And um, so, Ivan, you are the CEO of MedBoard. Um, and maybe let, let's talk more about yeah who you are first, and then we can uh, discuss about the topic of today, which is regulatory intelligence. Hi, Mari So um, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, MedBoard. So MedBoard, what we do is we integrate, we're creating this huge information portal about regulatory, about market, about clinical standards, PMS. And there we are creating different uh, uh, digital solutions to make life easier for people, but as well to automate and as well to allow people to find information much quicker, make better decisions and, and so on. So it's coming from a huge um uh, search engine um but as well we are creating specific solutions for uh, many professionals in the industry great and uh, yeah medboard is also uh, the sponsor of the monthly review of the podcast yes, we are. Uh, because we are we are i mean we try to help you to understand more about what is happening uh, within the the quality and regulatory affairs uh, activities and yeah we are using also medboard to help us for for that and it's why it's really a, a sponsor for 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 this uh, for this month uh, podcast so um okay uh, sorry money to interrupt that, that's the the main function you're doing there and the function we're doing here is to make information more accessible to people exactly is, it seems to be the problem to um to many professionals having this in a very um accessible and affordable way to access the information is out there Right, but um, it's not that easy to 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 collect. Exactly. So it's why we'll talk about that today. So mainly how yes. to collect that and why it's really important to uh, to do that. But before to start, um, may, I mean, as an introduction, mainly um, we talk about regulatory intelligence. Uh, it seems to be a big word that is, if I can say, be sometimes scary. So, what is really regulatory intelligence, and why is it really needed for for the industry? Very good question. Um, regulatory intelligence. Um, many, many of the situations we have today, we didn't have them 10 years ago, right? So if we look in the process of regulatory intelligence, it's always how we review systematically if it's possible, analyze and evaluate those uh, those changes and apply that those uh, or that information and data to the decision making of every organization, right? So when we look at uh, comparing research against intelligence, there is a huge difference, right? So in research, you use research for a specific topic and er- or area, but in intelligence, what you do, you apply to the context of our organization, department, or individual, right? So um, in many ways, you can you can we can put an analog- analogy. Uh, you can um, walk in a pathway, find a rock. You research how a rock in a in a pathway is gonna uh, create some disruption, and that's it, right? But if you do intelligence, you should learn that you stumble on that rock you're gonna fall right and you come across that rock two two times or three times and you stumble again it seems that you haven't learned anything so intelligence as well is a continuous process and it's a learning process as well within the organization why exactly. is it um i would say because two two reasons legally um you have now uh, the 13485 for example in the clause four they mentioned about keeping up to date you have risk management 14971 and so on. You have regulations as well. But as well, I would put in the context of uh, organizations uh, for the sake of keeping up to date, to anticipate changes and to respond to those changes. Because many of the times it's just about, hey, I heard something this new, but nothing happens after, right? So it's, it's that continuous process from identifying to actually to applying uh, that knowledge. Exactly, and uh, and and what you are saying is really important. Is also anticipate changes as we as we talk about. I mean, uh, recently, we I mean, recently a few years ago now, we talk about the the changes due to MDR. We try to educate people about that, and when the 
if I can say uh, the the timeline is is over, then uh, people were saying, oh, but uh, we don't have time, we don't have this and that. So the idea is really to anticipate to have something that is. Uh, we know what is coming. We know how maybe to put that in place, and we are um, anticipating any potential uh, issues or any uh, potential budget also that you need to make those, some changes or whatever. So, uh, so this is something that is uh, really really important. Um, regulatory intelligence, as you said, for ISO thirteen forty five uh, is needed. Uh, usually, we have also a clause within the management review where we say you have also to explain what are the different changes, etc. So, the idea here is also to because regulatory, we are like knowledgeable maybe, but maybe the top management is not also aware of those changes and what are the consequential changes. So I suppose this is also needed for informing the top management so that they can decide what to do uh, in the future. Yes, absolutely. And we see as well as the needs. Uh, it was much easier to do a management review 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, if we look at, for example, the statistics we have in MedBoard, uh, in 2015, uh, there were around 15, 20 news globally uh, per month. Now, today in 2023, there are between 100 and 150 news updates in terms of regulations, guidance all over the world. Now, so the, the reporting to the management as well is an education process to understand uh, many more things are happening uh, faster and more changes. Um, are happening. When we look into uh, what uh, professionals, organizations, they need as a, as a, as a, you know, as the tools to report to top management, uh, we always say about the toolkit that they need and as well about the process, right? If we look about the toolkit, what they need is a continuous access to trusted information, which is uh, external information. So, you know, in our case, we create and clean a lot of information and, and databases. But they need to create as well internal databases with the decision making. Uh, the second, I would say, is uh, a systematic review, how all those changes have been reviewed, right? So you can report, a hey, there was an update for the MDR. These are the actions we created. There's an update with this specific guidance. This is how we did it. And create a specific framework as well. How do we decide something is relevant? How we do we decide something is not relevant? How we decide something is going to have an impact on where are the actions. So all of that needs to be defined inside of a company and have obviously that framework. And the third important thing uh, in the toolkits, um, I would say, is the knowledge of that uh, organization. Because you have you can have a great database, you can have a great framework and process to, the, to, to, to review the information. But if the people are not trained enough uh, or they haven't been educated in those specific topics, obviously the decision making is not going to be uh, that accurate. And that's what it makes totally different uh, from organization to organization is how those individuals and teams are trained together. Because you can have the same um, databases, uh, you can have the same organization, you can have the same framework, but how it's used, it, it makes a lot of difference. If we look into, into the management review, I mentioned about the process, right? So uh, for professionals, it was much easier, much easier, like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, to actually create those management reports or to report to management uh, from time to time. I differentiate like four different steps. First is to be aware of those news, uh, which is a, a huge part, uh, especially uh, those that they need to do this manually, they will understand this is a, a huge part that uh, very laborious as well. The second part is to organize that information into like database repository, so you can obviously make those decisions uh, in terms of like organizing um, how it's going to be the impact. The third one is about the, the decision making, right? The impact assessment. So you have a, a new guidance, you have a new regulation, how those uh, regulations are impacting um, the organization, which portfolios, which actions um, as well, potentially they have. And all of that, that three third step is only required or is only um, possible with a great knowledge uh, of, of the organization. And the fourth one is more related to how those actions are implemented and as well how those are executed across the company so if we look in the and that would be the management review so you have the step one collecting second organizing the information third making the decision which ones they have an impact and the fourth is the implementation and actions that is when you can create um, as, um, a management review report and say to management review okay these are the ones that had an impact this is the actions that we need to take now, as you, as you know, as you are an expert in, in, in this topic, management reviews normally are 
six months, one year, uh, sometimes that's too late. So exactly. one of the key things that it has to happen, and that's how you know digital frameworks can help more, is to have this in more a continuous uh, basis. Because you go to a management review and say, oh, by the way, there was a new regulation or a new clinical guidance that, that we have to follow, but we didn't follow from one year ago. It obviously, it is not how it's, 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 it has to be done, right? So that communication, especially with the uh, bigger changes, uh, they need to be done more actively as well continues. Yeah, exactly. And as, as you said, so you can have access to the database, have access to the information, but first, if you don't know how to read it, so the interpretation is, is something that can be also damaging your, your company. Uh, somebody, when you read the sentence, understands something, but somebody else understands something else. So it's also this uh, this issue. And you're right also about gap assessment. So many, yes, you receive the information, you hear the information. Now, what will you do? What exactly is your action? What exactly will you um, put in place? Uh, the, which project you will be initiating for 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 making that? For example, I was an example uh, when you have when we had, for example, the ISO fourteen nine seven one uh, change uh, to two thousand nineteen version. Then the idea, okay, there is this change. What is the impact for me? Uh, how should I change my procedures? Uh, should I change all my risk management for all my products before, or should I wait a new update, etc.? So you have to have a plan uh, for that. And this is mainly what the notified bodies or, or anybody is looking at. Uh, what exactly is your plan for transitioning from a one version to a legislation or to a standard to a, to a, to another one? Um, we we talk also about I mean having access and doing that. But what is mainly your advice in terms of frequency? Because as you've said, um, every six months we have maybe a management review or every year. So. Uh, when you say it should be um, frequent, if I can say, well, what is the best frequency to make a check about uh, the uh, the regulatory uh, activities? As I said, for me, for example, at this medical device, we do that every month. So we do the monthly review so that we are providing everything. And we see that during one month, there are a lot of information that are coming. So what, what is your advice for any company to do uh, this, this kind of uh, review? So our suggestion... And as well, the feedback we get from our customers is weekly is the best frequency okay. to review news. The reason is if you review weekly, uh, you will have 20 maximum news. And it doesn't feel like a mountain to climb uh, a lot of news to, to review. Um, you do obviously the, the easy medical uh, report at the end of the month, and sometimes it's hundreds uh, of news. And it feels much more... Uh, obviously, it feels much more difficult uh, to do all of that. So what we get from customers, and, and they're very nice stories because they used to tell us, oh, this takes me like three days, two days, and now it takes me one hour, 20 minutes, right? So that's that's the huge advantage as well because it's the quality of life. But what they do is they book like a 30 minutes or 20 minutes uh, per week. They go through all the updates. They decide uh, whether it's relevant, not relevant, whether it has the potential impact. And then to just continue with their business, and obviously they will need to come back and decide which actions, right? So, and I think as well, one of the important things is to have a systematic review, how you're going to uh, review that information, right? So <clears throat> define what is going to be relevant, what is gonna, not going to be relevant, and create like a habit that is consistent, you know, with the organization. Leaving um, news more than beyond a month is a huge amount of work, especially if your company is in many jurisdictions. Exactly. And uh, I suppose that here you, we have also to have a specific procedure maybe uh, in our quality management system, like a document explaining that how we'll do that, what exactly should be done, what kind of reporting at the end should be provided, etc. So an evidence also that this was done. Uh, per the time that you have mentioned every week or every month, etc. So there should be also some kind of processes available to uh, to the companies. Absolutely. What we recommend is to create a process. So and as well, you know, in our case, because the step one, uh, being aware and organization the information, we do everything um, automatically. So eliminating that amount of work manual. In this, in the in the third part, that is the systematic review or the impact assessment and the implementation of actions, there should be a process. And there should be a process as well, not only to um, uh, the steps, but as well the questions you're going to ask. Um, you should you should be asking to any change in regulation, guidance, or any updates. Uh, does it change uh, my... The same way as you do a change notes, in many ways, you should create your own questions, how you're going to inquire those changes, right? Does it impact the registration? Does it impact the QMS? 
And then if the answer is any of those yes, then you should create which potential actions are required and you have everything organized. And as well, you can always look back as well. Why did I decide uh, three months ago, four months ago that that had an impact and I have to create this specific action as well? And, and and I suppose, yeah, that um, notified bodies really like to see those evidences that you have, uh, you are showing everything and that mm -hmm. it's really clear and everything is, is fire, I can say, organized. So they, they are really liking that. Yes. I mean, uh, one of the key things as well, and uh, obviously, you know, we work in the same environment, is going to a management review meeting with a list of 15 news um, that happened uh, in a year. And people look at you, this is the only work you have done. And obviously there is a much more work has been done to skim all the news to just 15, right? So maybe you re over the year, hundreds or even thousands, right? So in, in that type of, uh, you know, for example, for, with us, you can have a report and say, okay, you review 1,215 had an impact, right? So it's a very nice and clean way to show a, we, we follow a process, it was systematically reviewed and as well, these are the 15 news that had an impact. And from those 15, these are the actions we are taking. So, and as well, it's a way to show that how the organization is doing those, those decision makings, the same way as you do as well with the change notes. And as well, the more systematic reviews or impact assessments that are recorded, the more knowledge you are building within the organization. So as you know, people, and this is the frustration that many people come to us is they don't want to spend their time uh, searching, you know, you imagine you have your degree, you have 15 years of experience or even more or your master's degree and you spend your time searching websites and copying and pasting because one of the key things as well is is not being aware of the news and I know like uh, as social media and we share a lot as well in social media, people, ah, I'm, a, I'm aware of that news, I'm aware of that happens. But th that's the beginning, it's just copying and pasting is what it causes more issues to uh, to people. So. If that person can be more useful, obviously it will be more useful. It can be more used in those steps for making the decision making and recording that decision making, then the organization will benefit in the long term by having a process as well as you say, Monir. What you do is it doesn't matter if it's you or me or someone else in the future. It just follows the same process all the time. Now, if you do this manually, only you know how you have been searching in those websites, how you've been copying and pasting those in those websites, the same as me. So um, anytime they get a replacement uh, with someone else, it, it, the process starts over because that person has to learn how to do those things that the other person was doing. And, you know, that that's quite difficult for companies in terms of uh, keeping that consistency. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, law uh, regulations, etc., that are changing. Um, the companies, as you've said, have to go to. The, I mean, the the people have maybe to go to each website, maybe have bookmarks of the websites and go to this one, this one, searching. Sometimes the website is in English, sometimes it's in an other language, sometimes it's really difficult, etc. Um, so here, the the person has different levels also of information to look at we have the legislation from the countries we have the guidances we have the standards we have uh, some uh, notifications only so there are i mean this start to to be a big chunk of of data to to look at so i suppose that you have also to put some kind of hierarchy in terms of the the level of information and the importance of this information absolutely i think one of the key things as well is to how to prioritize right you have a lot of news you need to prioritize what what have which ones they will have more potential impact to your to your company. So it, it ourselves, what we do is we use um, AI to organize the hierarchy level, and obviously it's not the same. We have from regulation to guidance to news to notice and so on. So then we allow people to filter. Um, so obviously, as you know, doing a management review or doing a monthly review, what you would be more interested in is to check the regulatory changes. And the next one, the guidance changes. So in that hierarchy, obviously, the more um, higher in that hierarchy, like legislation, there's more, um, obviously, enforcement uh, in you know the, the actions you need to make. So having a hierarchy and as well organizing that by hierarchy is very key as well, how you prioritize those actions. Hey, just a second. Do you need a EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer 
contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. And in terms of, um, because we talk a lot about digitalization, so how, how on this whole process, how, what is the advantage and maybe some limitations uh, due to the digitalization? So there are many. I mean, one of the key things that I will highlight is the quality of life of that person. Um, and if we look okay. at the step one, two, <laughs> three, and four, if you shift that person from doing one and two, um, spending hours and hours searching in websites, you know, for example, uh, your, yourself, you know, when you do the monthly um, review report, instead of using your time in the one and two, you're using the three and four about making the decision about where you're going to talk about that impact of those news. That's a huge advantage. So exactly. That, that's one of the key things that we've been reporting is the quality of life. Um, and I think as well, when we look into uh, the needs of people and we talk about AI, I know we're going to talk about AI later on, people are not looking for how to a machine is going to do better decisions than them. It, you know, what they're looking is especially to replace those manual, boring, tedious tasks, right? Because yourself, for example, you know how to make a decision. You have your own criteria. But the needs is how I can make this process faster, right? So I would say that there are like many benefits. I will highlight this instant and continuous access to trusted information. You know, with, with ourselves in Medboard, we see ourselves, we are trust as a service. So it's how we create as well those accessible um, uh, data, but when we create summaries of our requirements, we do a specific uh, classifications as well. And one of the key things as well is to how to standardize the process. Uh, even in, you know, we are in 2023, uh, people like copy and paste go there. Oh, I heard something in the news. I heard something in LinkedIn. And that's how the uh, regulatory intelligence is built. The other thing is, is a more organization centric knowledge. So by having all of that information in just one place, with how the decisions are being made, you create organization centric knowledge. So if someone is new in the team, can go through those and understand, okay, why Monir said that guidance was not applicable. And there's a reason there. Okay, that's it. Uh, I learned about that. And the other thing is, is it helps to be more continuous and consistent. Um, you know, we have all this 14-7, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, one and, and so on uh, to, to push people to do more things um, continuously and active. Uh, the same with the literature or the PMS. But well, how can you do that when you need to do the step one and the step two manually? It is impossible. And uh, every every time you know we start a week, we start with a very um, uh, hoping with a lot of uh, you know wishes that okay this week I'm gonna you know have everything um, organized, everything on top, and then you start your week and you have few calls, a uh, few meetings, and then you cannot keep up to date. Especially if you have an audit, you can forget totally about keeping up to date with with those news. So the huge advantage is uh, the the platform or any digital platforms well can keep working for you uh, on those on those aspects. And the most important thing I think, I think for us is people can focus on what really matters. That is to use their knowledge and experience. So exactly. we don't want to use professionals to copy and paste on to visiting websites all the time. What we want is people actually making those decisions that are very really well trained, very well educated in those processes focusing on that on that specific uh, step. Exactly. And uh, just to explain how, how the process of the monthly review, for example, for Easy Medical Device is working so mainly uh, with MedBoard, we have a systematic uh, review that is uh, initiated where um, all the news are there. And uh, at the end, what I have just to do is just to go there to check each news and say, okay, I will talk about this or no, I don't talk about that yeah. or it's important or not important. So I, I just put it as uh, yes, relevant or not relevant, etc. And then I have at the end my list of all the news that I have to look at. And the, if I can say tedious part is also to read them each one by one, interpret them and then provide the, the news. But as, as, as Ivan mentioned, at the beginning, I don't have any more to go to each website, to the European medical, uh, um, uh, the European website, the Swiss medic website, the MHA website. Uh, everything is on at one place. I just have now to uh, read. There is still this part of reading, uh, but uh, maybe this part will also be <laughs> removed soon uh, because uh, we wanted also to talk about AI. So is what about AI? So are you using AI or are you planning to use AI? And will this remove some 
work for quality and regulatory affairs. Like for me, for example, now I will just have my script of the news directly, no need for me to read that again. So internally in uh, MedBoard and the ones that use MedBoard, we've been using AI for the last three years, right? So we've been experimenting a lot with AI. Now, if we look into the steps I described before, one, two, three, and four, the one and two are very general, right? So uh, you can use, uh, we use AI very much to organize the information, to clean the information and, and so on. Now in the steps three and four, it's a much more complicated because the decision making is, let's say, is far, um, it's more complex than just one, you know, decision making that you need to take in in that sense. So what we what we implementing or what we experimenting as well is, you know, how to obviously support more as a supporting tool and and so on. But there are like a different type of um, uh, challenges as well. And we we actually, we released, uh, I think it was two years ago, um, a classifier, AI classifier for MDR, IVDR. Um, same way, like similar to JGPT and so on, but obviously a much le um, less, um, you know, depends. Um, one of the key things as well is if you are a an expert, right? Um, you don't need that support of AI because AI, there are two things that they don't actually get very well. One of the things is the context reality. So they don't understand why they're doing that. And as well, they don't understand all the different type of um, inputs they are getting. And the second one is they don't get all the internal feedback that you get from your notified buddy, from your colleagues and so on. So when we talk about AI, we're talking about data. And to have a good data, we will need all those sources to be standardized and harmonized. So imagine, Monir, when you make a decision uh, about with a customer or you made a decision in the past about a change note, it's not just one input that you get. Um, you need to talk to different departments. You need to use the knowledge in the past. You need to as well search for additional information that you never thought, uh, or you may need to consult as well the notified body and so on. For AI, that's rather difficult, right? So the the key thing that for us is, you know, especially myself, I've been working inside of the industry, so we understand how difficult those decisions are built, right? So we think for the step one and step two that we use heavily AI, that's very useful. For a step two and a step three is my much more difficult step. So for us, the human is the main important part of this uh, decision making. So if we can accelerate or highlight different type of information, uh, yes. But in order to make that decision, it's a much more complex, and as well opens other type of questions. Um, if you use an AI again, it's about the data, right? So if you train an AI with the same data, let's imagine our organization, then all the companies are going to make pretty much the same decisions. And it shouldn't be that way because obviously uh, every company is going to have different approaches, is going to have different knowledge, how to apply that information. So we live in more than one singularity. You know, I have the same question about uh, not only regulatory as well, PMS and clinical evaluation. How does it work that all the AIs will have the same answers uh, because if you train the data with the same um, with the same data, if you look to train with a different data, you're going to have many different AIs, and it's how you validate as well that. So it, it opens a much more difficult, um, you know, how to solve, how to actually predict those answers in a in a very accurate way. Yeah, and uh, I agree with you. And uh, I tested myself a lot of. Uh... Um, yeah, uh, things about AI related also to ChatGPT, for example, uh, trying to feed ChatGPT with some questions or, and some information, and um, the, the 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 answers may be can be different per how you feed the, the the tool. If you feed him with accurate information, you can get maybe some accurate info, uh, answer. But if you feed him just with some general information without really context. So yeah, it, it's really difficult for, for this tool to take a decision. And it's not making decisions, it's just aggregating information in a certain way that it suits what you are asking. But an AI cannot, if I can say, take a decision unless 
it's uh, prompted by saying yeah uh, by some statistics or percentage to say if you reach 91% then you do this if you reach 76% then you do that etc etc so it's really difficult for this but for me ai is more a tool to summarize make things more if i can say um uh, aggregated and working together instead of g- going to many info- many sources of information you can uh, with an ai maybe collect information and then interpret the information in a certain way but um I also find out that AI can make a lot of mistakes also because when I I, I ask him question about some regulatory uh, elements, there are a lot of que- of of issues. For example, ChatGPT thinks that the medical device uh, regulation is uh, the head or the 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 the, he- the organization that is heading the medical device regulation is the EMS or European Medicine Agency when it's not. So it's many of this kind of, of thinking that is um, that is um, understood by, by 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 the tool. But at the end, yeah, it's normal. They, they were not fed with the right information. So it's why uh, they, they, they are making mistakes. But so it means that yes. I still have a job, if I can say. <laughs> so. I, I, I think I think that the uh, jobs are not, you know, like, um, in fact, they will need to be more training how to use those tools um, but still the human would be the, the key part you know one of the key things you what you said is you know there we have a lot of anecdotes about that you know we with this classifier ai what we found out when we released it is if we were copying and pasting and, and we had actually a, a very funny situation in um because it, it worked very well as well uh in a conference a few weeks ago a few few weeks ago if an expert were using the tool uh, then it would give like near 100% accuracy in the classification. If someone was not very accurate uh, or didn't have the knowledge to do a prompt in, in our chat back in the two, two years ago, then the answer will be wrong. Um, so what we found out is if you are very uh, a very good expert, you don't need such a tool for making decisions. If you are not that expert, you need more than a chat. Uh, you need more than AI exactly. in that sense. And, and the other thing is, when we think about AI, we need to think about data, right? And how the data is trained. And the biggest struggle as well, and how we use as well inside uh, AI is, um, the authorities, they don't share information in a standardized way. So this is the famous uh, garbage in, garbage out. So if you put titles or information that is not standardized, and sometimes we see this, you know, recently, like, um, you know, I need to say this, you know, how the MDCG 2020-3, there is a new version and it's called 2020-3 version one. You know, we we can even see from the authorities not actually sharing things in a very organized way. So all of that, you know, and we do a lot of cleaning ourselves because the information is not shared standardized. Right. Exactly. And so, uh, and we we made a lot of comments about those versioning of the MDCG yeah. with also the table of changes. What is the change between each version, etc. For them, this is version zero first and then version one second, etc., which is like making no sense. But at the end, yeah, I mean, it's it's true that if even the commission is not able to make a good document practices <laughs> rules, it can be also scary for 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 the manufacturers then. So so you know that makes a lot of difference. When, when we think about the you know specific requirements and summaries, so we have nearly, I think, 50,000 blocks of summaries in more than 200 countries, right? And what we build in is more like a trusted uh, information related to a specific requirements that we can use, right? Because relying only on the inputs, you rely too much how that information is being shared, and maybe there could be some mistakes, some information. So they always needs like a human verification and you raised an important point before about trust. You know, the 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 the, the function, especially in regulatory, is how do you build trust? How you make good decisions in terms with authorities, with their own company, and so on. And if you don't have the right data, um, you're not going to have obviously uh, a good chances to build trust because you may you may make your decisions based on information that is not accurate. Exactly. No, I think um, I think it's it's really important here to to um, to start to use digital tools, but um, it, it will be at a certain pace that uh, it will arrive to a certain maturity and optimization. So uh, don't expect that uh, 
yeah, AI will be revolutionizing uh, everything for the moment, but it will be, yeah, there will be some progress. Uh, we just need to uh, to be patient about it and uh, to, uh, yeah, to learn more also about, about it. As you said, it's it's a tool, so we have to learn how to use it, how to prompt it, how to uh, provide it the right information, because, yeah, we, we have maybe some people that are listening to them that will test some AI tools like ChatGPT, but if you don't know really how to write your sentence or how to write your question to uh, the tool with all the details, etc., uh, it can be um, yeah, it can be um, a failure for you. But if you know how to do it, it can be really successful and helping you a lot. As you said, if you are an expert, you know exactly how to prompt a question. If you are not expert, saying just how can I be UMDR certified, it can be okay. <laughs> it's you like, need uh, something else. You need yeah. something else. Another thing I would highlight as well is the the AI, all these like, you know, magic solutions that, you know, they've been sometimes pushed to us is they don't capture the feedback from your notified body or from your auditor and so on that is being raised, you know, uh, during the previous uh, meetings and so on. So maybe the auditor is telling you, uh, and this happened as well, like um, there are some classifications right now um, with the specific implantables that they contradict what actually the MDCG says, because the notified body thought this is a class three device you're going to have trained on this MDCG uh, information and it's going to give you a class 2B, whether you're not fit, but it's going to say uh, it's a class 3. So you're going to, obviously, there's going to be a myth, disconnection there because the, that program will never understand that actually there's some uh, uh, communication relationship there that needs to be uh, taken in account. Exactly. Um, okay, so I think we made a good explanation now of what is regulatory intelligence, um, why people should be using that, how to do that, and how to uh, maybe use digital tools for that. So um, tell us more now about MedBoard. So why people should be using MedBoard and, and how they can um, get maybe to, to use it and to know more about it? So if people care about their time, as well about the quality of time, you know, obviously uh, Medboard is, is is the right tool for them. So obviously what we're doing is creating a systematic review, creating a, in the in the toolkit that we, we specified before. Uh, so we are using this for regulatory, for standards, for PMS, for market, and as well for clinical. So a lot of people use as well for clinical uh, literature. So what, we, what we're doing is facilitating the step one and two, how to collect, how to organize the information, creating that framework as well, so they can access to that information uh, very quickly and make those decisions and as well report in a much faster way. In addition to that, we are creating uh, the largest created database uh, as well with all the uh, all the actors in the on the market, manufacturers, products, uh, hospitals. Uh, we're gonna start adding as well key opinion leaders and, and many others. So what we're trying to build as well is a trusted ecosystem uh, with real time data, right? So. If you look into a specific information about um, a regulatory or clinical, you want to know what's the latest. Uh, so our uh, platform can provide that at uh, any given time as well. So uh, for uh, for us, it's how to build this uh, trusted, um, accessible as well. Most of the times, uh, you know, regulatory and clinical, they have budget, budget constraints because, you know, other solutions that are quite much older than us. Um, only few can afford that. So we are, you know, we are focusing how we can democratize that access to these huge databases, but as well, these tools, you know, like uh, systematic reviews or profiles or data, uh, databases, uh, anal analytics, they, they can give you the information straight away, or you can just build those processes that work for you uh, all the time as well. Exactly. And uh, as I said, we are using here at Easy Medical Device uh, Medboard, and we are really uh, satisfied, so it's why I'm really happy to to promote this uh, this tool because we, it's uh, it's helping uh, helping us a lot. As I said to you, I'm using that uh, monthly for the monthly review, but my team is also using that for uh, other activities like uh, talking about clinical evaluation, uh, literature search, uh, post marketing surveillance, uh, anything like that. Uh, and we use that also uh, for uh, our customers uh, when we have uh, as we are authorized representative for our customers. So the idea is also to do a systematic review of what's happening happening on the market with the products of our customers so to just make an alert for each of them. So we make an alert and then uh, if if there is an event specifically about our one of our customers, then it, we receive the information and say, oh, there is an issue or there is a, an event that comes with uh, with this uh, this product. So I uh, really advise you to to go and check that uh, to uh, at uh, which, what is the website? Medboard.com, I think. Eh? 
Yes, mailbot.com, yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so where people can follow up with you if they have some questions, maybe? Uh, well, uh, the obvious one, uh, so we're going to share this and uh, LinkedIn uh, okay. or, you know, Ivan P uh, at medborco.com as well. Okay. So, you know, either way or through their website as well, you know, they can contact us. Great. So I let people go directly to you if they have any question about regulatory intelligence or if they want to make a review of uh, of what is Medboard and how, how this is working. Uh, I think it will be a really great. Um, okay, Ivan, so really thank you for all the information that you provided. Um, I will have all the details on the show notes so if, if people want to uh, uh, to check that. I think there will be maybe a link for a blog or something like that that, that, that will be uh, talking about regulatory intelligence. Uh, so don't hesitate to go on the show notes and uh, check uh, what is there. Uh, and uh, if you have any comments or questions or whatever, don't hesitate also to go to the comment section for YouTube or the comment section for the other uh, tools or even on, on LinkedIn if you are interested uh, so that uh, you, you ask your question or you maybe provide your, your feedback also about, uh, about regulatory intelligence. Okay, Ivan, it was really a pleasure. Thank you very much and I wish you a nice day. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and uh, yeah, uh, listen to uh, next time as well. Yeah, Great, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.